these are my disclosures. None of them are significant for uh, today's presentation. So the reason why we should talk about them is that almost about 16% of the graph <laughs> will re rupture at an average of about two years, especially when we're looking at children or patients less than 20 years old. And a whopping 15% of them will also have contralateral ACL ruptures at around three and a half to four years. If you again look at this paper that was um, uh, published by Aaron Pritch's group, they showed that when you compare female soccer players, what sort of risk of injury do they have a second ACL injury, both on the ipsilateral and the contralateral side? I think if you're looking at uh, athletic sports, this is definitely on the highest side. So that brings us to the fact is that we should understand that ACL tears probably are not as isolated as what we think they are. And Andy Williams did show in his uh, paper that almost about 63% or two thirds of patients who are professional athletes will have an associated injury to the anterolateral complex. And this is, I think, an important fact that we need to really take in mind. Though we still talk about individualized ACL reconstruction, I think it's time that we extend this individualization also to the lateral side, because the presence of this pivot shift which can be very well be seen both preoperatively and intraoperatively needs to be taken care of. And this becomes one of the main reasons why patients, if they don't have restoration of the pivot shift, they will have poorer outcomes, persistent rotary instability and decreased rates of return to sports. So essentially what is happening is that we have an injury to the anterolateral complex. And when the tibia translates anteriorly, the tibiofemoral contact point shifts posteriorly and laterally, and that is when you get an abnormal rotatory instability, which becomes all the most important. And this is essentially coupled anterior tibial translation and internal rotation, which is what we need to tackle. A nice talk by Dr. Moira, which did show that the ramp is a secondary restraint for anterior instability. Well, we also know very well that the anterolateral complex is a primary restraint for anterolateral rotatory instability, which is what we need to take care of. And that brings us to the indications for doing as to when we should do a procedure on the lateral side. Yes, we are aware that the ACL is the primary stabilizer of coupled anterior tibial translation and internal rotation near extension. But the secondary stabilizer, which is very important, is the iliotibial band, which includes the Kaplan fiber system, the lateral meniscus, the anterolateral capsule, as well as the anterolateral ligament. So the ALL, as we all know, has uh, you know been quite in news, and um, this essentially it can be seen in about 83% of patients, but courses superficial to the LCL, which is the most important part. So the anterolateral complex is the important secondary stabilizer after the ACL is torn. And when you get a disruption of the anterolateral complex, as well as the ACL, you get a grade three pivot, which has to be restored with a combined ACL and lateral procedure. So the indications to do this is one in the revisions. The reason being is that, you know, you are at a higher failure risk. Second is in those patients who have a high grade pivot shift. This happens because they have secondary attrition of their lateral structures. One would do this procedure when you have generalized ligament laxity or genuri curvatum, which is more than 10 degrees. And the reason being is that you need to tackle the so-called so -called physiologic rotatory laxity, which is harmful to your uh, surgically placed ACL graft. And the fourth indication in my practice is younger patients who wish to return back to pivoting activities because you want to protect the ACL graft. So how will you do this? You can do this by doing an anatomic anterolateral ligament reconstruction, which can be done in a minimally invasive fashion. The trick is to place it superficial to the LCL. You can use an autograft or an allograft for this procedure. The key is that you need to have the femoral tunnel proximal and posterior to the lateral collateral ligament. You have to tension this at full extension, which is very important, with at least about a 20 newton force. And one of the drawbacks is that there may be some, ton some tunnel coalition with uh, the ACL reconstruction. And if you're using autograft, especially the hamstrings graft, then you know there could be a problem with availability of graft and cost is an issue because you need to put in three screws uh, for this procedure. So how would you do an ALL reconstruction? You take the gracilis, whip stitch it, and make it into a two-tailed graft. 
size up both the ends of the gracilis and then have your three points on the tibial side you will have it somewhere in between the gurdy's tubercle and the neck of the fibula and on the femoral side you want it posterior and proximal to the lateral epicondyle of uh, the femur you want to ensure that your graft is going to be taut in extension and lacks in flexion and if so then you then proceed to making the sockets to place your graft and then you place it superficial to the lateral collateral ligament and you can fix it with the help of screws or any form of knotless anchors that you so desire. The lateral extraarticular tenodesis, which is more popular, is essentially a non-anatomic procedure, which is done as an open procedure. It utilizes the iliotibial band, either proximal or distal. You have to pass it deep to the LCL, which is the main differentiating point from the ALL, and you have to tension it around 50 to 60 degrees, which is important. Because you're using superficial implants, then the risk of tunnel collision with the ACL tunnel is quite less and it is relatively a cheaper procedure. So the most commonly performed procedure would be the modified Lemaire procedure in which we harvest a strip of um, the irritable band, which is based distally. You want to palpate the Gurdy's tubercle, you want to palpate where the lateral epicondyle is and then now you want to cut out a strip which is at least about 8 millimeters in width and should be about 8 to 10 centimeters long. You want to dissect it free from the underlying um, FCL bursa, the, the bursa which overlies the fibular collateral ligament, and then, <coughs> sorry, I beg your pardon, release it proximally with the help of a uh, methods and bomb scissor, and then you have a strip which is at least about 8 to 10 centimeters long, which is based uh, distally on your Gurdy's tubercle. You want to whip stitch the end of this particular strip that you've harvested, with some strong suture. I personally prefer a number two high strength suture. Make sure that you put in a good number of crack out stitches. And then once this has been done, the next step that is there for you is to dissect underneath the fibular collateral ligament. This can be accomplished quite easily by removing uh, the bursa that overlies the FCL. You can palpate the tip of the fibula and you feel the LCL as a taut structure, which can be seen very nicely. Um, <clears throat> And all that you need to do is to sort of uh, pass this graft underneath the FCL and then bring it on to the lateral side of the femur. When you want to fix this, you can fix this either with a screw or with a staple. What is important is that you need to go posterior and proximal in the area where the Kaplan fibers are inserted and then do a tenubisis at about 50 to 60 degrees of the flexion with the foot in neutral rotation. You have to take care to avoid any form of internal rotation which will cause over constraint and this is how it will look at the end of the procedure. The next procedure that you can do is a modified Ellison's procedure. Again the same landmarks. You make an incision about five centimeters based on the Gurdy's tubercle extended proximally. Again you release a strip of the iliotibial band about eight millimeters in width but the only difference is that you now release it distally from the Gurdy's tubercle and then reflect it proximally, put some strong, um, you put a five millimeter titanium anchor at the insertion point on the Gurdy's tubercle. Once that has been done, take a small vicryl suture and now you pass this underneath the FCL as what you would do with the modified Lemaire and then do a tenodesis with the knee at about 60 degrees of flexion back to its insertion point on the Gurdy's tubercle and put in some knots to secure the fixation. So <clears throat> this is how you would do a modified Ellison's type of procedure and then you will cover up the defect with the help of a couple of sutures. So the consensus is that definitely we need to add something onto the lateral side to reduce the rotational instability but the debate is which procedure one should do and what fixation angle and how should we use the fibular collateral ligament. So what do I do in my clinical practice? And I think um, I've taken a lot of inspiration from this study published uh, uh, in the GSOCOS by a couple of my friends. They looked at all the various five types of uh, lateral extraarticular tenodesis, the ALL, the modified Ellison, modified uh, deep and superficial Lemaire, as well as the modified Macintosh. And what they found out was that there was more over constraint uh, there was, so there was less over constraint with the modified Ellison and the ALL and a higher degree of constraint with the Macintosh and the Lemaire. And this is essentially because 
the force vector that we use with a modified lemma acts over a longer a longer area and which is why it causes more constraint so in my clinical practice if there is a primary acl then i would probably do a modified elson or a modified all because it is going to restore normal kinematics and it is not going to over constrain the lateral side but if i'm doing the revision acl or some one with a very explosive grade 3 pivot then i would use a modified lemmer because i want to tide over the abnormal kinematics and help these patients so to conclude indications are revision acls high grade pivot shifts and general recovery more than 10 degrees generalized ligament laxity and young patients returning to pivoting activities thank you very much Thank you.